All right, so chapter four is very similar to chapter three in the sense that we're going to be doing a lot of stoichiometry, but we're not talking about solids necessarily. What we're really talking about is aqueous solutions, and it's actually one of the more important topics we're going to do all year. Aqueous solutions are a huge thing um, because most reactions that we do take place in solution. And so we're going to talk about the different types of reactions, primarily in this chapter, I'm going to talk about two of them. There is a third, but that doesn't come up until next semester. And we're going to do stoichiometry, of course. So when it comes to solutions, you need to recognize what they are. A solution is a mixture. It's homogenous. You can't see the individual parts. They're all mixed together quite thoroughly. And the solute is the thing that gets dissolved. It is technically the amount, the one that is present in lesser amount. And the solvent is the thing that does the dissolving, and it's the one that's present in greater amount. So if we were talking a solution other than an aqueous solution, air, for example, nitrogen is the solvent because there's more nitrogen in air than anything else, and oxygen and carbon dioxide are solutes. But when we're talking aqueous solutions, we're talking water is the solvent. And if it's soluble, that means it can be dissolved. And so we're pretty much talking about things that will dissolve in water when we're talking aqueous solutions. And if they're insoluble, they form a solid. So you need to be able to recognize between this um, and electrolytes where are things that will dissociate completely in water and conduct electricity. These are ionic compounds, things like Na plus Cl minus salt or CaCl2, which is Ca2+, and 2Cl-. Those guys, because they're ions and they're free to move and they dissolve in water, they can conduct electricity. Okay, so in an aqueous solution, if this is my little water molecule, water is an excellent solvent because it is very polar. One end of it is very positive and the other end of it is very negative and it's very good at taking things that have polarity or are ionic and breaking them apart into ion by ion or molecule by molecule. So it dissolves an awful lot of things. It won't dissolve some things, but for the most part it's pretty good at it. The process of breaking the salts apart is called hydration or dissociation. That is the more commonly used word. What happens is the ions have charges, things like salt, positive end, negative end. They're attracted to the opposite charge on the water molecule. And like I said, one end of it's positive and the other end of it's negative. And if the ions in the solid are more attracted to water, the water will dissolve them. If they are more attracted to each other, then the substance won't dissolve. And a good example of this is calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate is much more attracted to itself than it is to water. And so what happens is it stays together. And this is um, the basis for coral reefs. Calcium carbonate makes up coral reefs. And because it doesn't dissolve in water, it's a reef, I guess. Okay, so this is what it looks like. If I had my little... Um, Na plus here. Okay, it's a positively charged ion. And all these little water molecules, they look like Mickey Mouse heads. The red end of it is negatively charged and it's attracted to the sodium and it pulls it out of the solid. This part, the chloride, is negatively charged and the hydrogen atoms are positive and they come in and they all grab this little negative thing and they pull it apart and then this chloride gets pulled apart and then that sodium and one by one the water comes in the little Mickey Mouse heads and pulls things out and that's how things dissociate they break apart into the ions if they're ionic if they're molecules then they break apart into the molecules but we're primarily talking about ionic substances so each time it breaks apart dissolves in water breaks apart into its constituent ions so NaCl turns apart into Na plus and Cl minus. I don't care if you write the AQs because if you write the charges, it's implied. You can't write NaAQ. There is no such thing. Um, 
when I look at that, I think elemental sodium without a charge. There is a huge difference between elemental sodium and the ion that comes out of water. Elemental sodium, you put it in water, it's going to explode. The ion, you put it in water, and that's salt water. Okay, It's not that big of a deal. Same thing with the chloride. You need to write it as Cl-. minus. Um, again, you don't have to have the aqueous, but you certainly cannot write this. Okay, that's chlorine gas. It was used as mustard gas in World War II. There is a huge difference between this and this. Okay, so write the charges, but don't write the aqueous. So if I did CaCl2, it breaks apart into Ca2 plus and chloride, Cl1 minus. You're undropping and swapping it. I'm balancing it and putting a 2 there because in order for this charge to cancel out the positive charge, I have to have two of the chloride ions. That's why it's there. So if I did AlCl3, it'd be Al3+, plus. it breaks apart into the ions, into its name, aluminum ion and chloride ion, and there are three chloride ions. If I was to do this one, again, it's an ionic substance, it's going to break apart into its name, that's sodium phosphate, it's going to break apart into sodium ion, and there are three of them, and it's going to break apart into phosphate ion, not P and O. Okay, it breaks apart into its name, phosphate and sodium. Okay, calcium nitrate breaks apart into the ions of which it is made, calcium ion and nitrate ion, and there are two nitrate ions, and it's not N and O. You break it apart into the name. And so for this one, the last one, it breaks apart into aluminum ion, two of those, and sulfate ion, three of those. So in the microscopic view, this is where you're kind of learning to basically count. I'm not going to draw the pictures, but I want you guys to understand that what happens is it breaks apart into one Na plus and one Cl minus. So every one mole of NaCl gives me one mole of sodium ion and one mole of chloride ion. It's similar to a bicycle in that sense. So if I took one bicycle and I broke it apart, I would get one back wheel and one front wheel. And it's the same idea. Okay, sometimes people have a hard time recognizing that if I have one mole, how do I get one mole and one mole? It's because these guys are smarter, smaller parts of that. That's why it works. So if I have calcium chloride, it breaks apart into one Ca2 plus and two chlorides. So for every one mole of this, I get one mole of calcium and two moles of chloride. So this is like a tricycle. I break it apart, I get one front wheel and two back wheels. If I had one mole of AlCl3, I would get one mole of aluminum ion and three moles of chloride ion. So this is more like a car. I break it apart, I get one wheel and then three more. Okay, same thing here. This one's more like the tricycle. If I have one mole, I'm going to get one mole of calcium ion and two moles of nitrate ion. And the last one, I don't even know what it's like. You get two moles of Al3 plus and three moles of sulfate. And being able to do that.